just ask. I'm just going to mute people. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so um, for the uh, United Classroom Physics Group, but also for everyone else who's watching, um, this is our first masterclass um, where we're going to be thinking about some of the ideas that we've been working on in AS Physics. Um, I should just introduce myself. I'm Dr. Uh, Rob Bastin, and um, I'm helping with this today um, using the United Classroom. Uh, we've also got our students, uh, WAVE students, if you feel free to. Hey. Um, a few of them will be joining us in a, in a minute, uh, just coming from lessons and those kind of things as well. And the most important person we have here today is Professor uh, Bobby Acharya, who's based at King's College London. Uh, and his work concentrates, hey Sophie, um, his work concentrates on uh, particle physics and especially using some of the most amazing technology in the world at places like CERN and, and that kind of thing. So he's going to talk all about those kind of things. Now, um, as uh, I've pointed out to the students, but also um, as you can get the link on the YouTube page, um, there is opportunity in this to ask questions. Um, Professor Acharya is going to kind of talk us through his ideas and, and the things that he's working on for the first bit of this. But if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them as we get towards the end. And there'll be time to, to do that dedicated for both the people within this classroom, uh, the physics students we have here, and also for the audience watching in other places in the group. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Professor Acharya, who's going to talk to us about particle physics. So um, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, meet you all virtually and uh, uh, take part in this uh, take part in your course and give this uh, little lecture. So I'm going to share some slides. I think they're also linked on the YouTube page if you want to download them or if you haven't already. Um, but I'm going to go through um, these slides which will form the basis of my presentation. So what I thought um, would be a good idea would be to just, because we've only got you know an hour or so, um, give a sort of just an overview of, uh, of the field of particle physics, which is my um, sort of area of research and expertise. So I'm going to share some slides. I think they're also linked on the YouTube. So down the, the title uh, of the presentation um, you know, is uh, Understanding the Mysteries of Matter with the CERN Large Hadron Collider. So the Hadron Collider um, is our sort of most powerful and useful, in many ways, um, experimental tool for exploring um, ideas in particle physics. Okay, so in more detail, um, sort of this this slide here sort of summarizes kind of the way that a particle physicist thinks about the universe and how we go about exploring. Um, uh, the rules of the universe and the behavior of elementary particles. So on the left, the picture on the left here is uh, are all the known elementary particles uh, in nature. And they're, they're described by what's called the standard model of particle physics. So this is actually a mathematical model. It's a set of equations which describes very precisely how different particles um, interact. So we'll come back to this, uh, the standard model, a bit later, but it's, it's um, one of the greatest achievements of human thought, in a way, um, that uh, all, of, all of the known matter, um, or at least most of the known matter, at least the matter on Earth and the matter in stars and much of the matter in galaxies, um, it's actually described by this very simple model. Um, now there's one particle, one additional known elementary particle which is not on here and it's called the Higgs boson. And that's one of the reasons that we built the Large Hadron Collider. So the, the picture in the middle which says energy of the universe, um, that okay, so, um, sort of just, it's just there to sort of symbolize that we actually, particle physics, even though elementary particles are tiny little things, um, we use them and, and, and this standard model, this mathematical description, to actually describe 
um, how the universe came to be the way it is. So the universe is actually expanding, and which means yesterday it was actually smaller, and last year it was even smaller. And if you go back um, to close to the beginning of the universe, you know, just over 10 billion years ago, it was actually very, very tiny. And we can sort of track its history, and at different phases in the different periods of the universe's history, different processes involving these elementary particles on the left became more and more important at different, different epochs. And we'll come back to that as well, hopefully. And then um, on the right, we've got you know, a schematic of the Large Hadron Collider, which is our sort of experimental tool. And we'll discuss that a little bit as well. Now, the mysteries of matter that were mentioned in the title, one of them is actually this, this particle called the Higgs boson. And the other one is dark matter. So um, we've, you know, we know that we ourselves and the stuff on Earth is made out of um, uh, atoms, and we know the atoms contain electrons and protons and neutrons, and um, the protons and neutrons you know, themselves contain uh, smaller particles called quarks, which are, you know, you can see some of the quarks uh, in, in that list of elementary particles. But we also know actually that most of the matter in the universe is not made of any known particle, and that's the so-called dark matter. And we'll touch upon that a little bit um, as well. So these are the sort of the sort of you know the things which are really important in particle physics, and um, sort of I'm trying to give an idea of how a particle physicist sees the universe, and uh, uh, we'll get get an idea of actually the, how we go about. Um, understanding um, the nature of matter. Particle physics is all about understanding the nature of matter, what matter is, what's it made of, um, and the stuff that it's made of, how does that stuff actually behave? And those are the, 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 the so-called elementary particles. Okay, I've got a bit of history which you will know. Um, you know, all of the, the, the the matter on Earth, as you know, um, fits into this very simple classification, which is called the periodic table. Um, now, this sorry, this uh, table, the, the fact that it's got this regular sort of structure related to you know the numbers of protons and electrons and so on, um, is that the, the structure is there because of the nature of atoms. So in other words, we've got these elements, and the, the very existence of the periodic table that, that different groups of elements have different um, properties, you know, in the different columns, some of the, you know, in the different columns, different atoms, I mean, the atoms that belong to one column will, will exhibit um, simple universal properties. Um, that actually points to the existence of atoms which is the underlying structure um, that gives rise, the, the underlying sort of nature that gives rise to the structure in this table. Now, to put that, put atoms into context, you know, we are made of, of atoms. We know that Earth is made of atoms. We know that stars are, they all seem to be made of atoms as well. You know, we have very precise models of, uh, of how stars, be, how they're actually created and how they behave and um, evolve over their lifetimes. And, you know, um, they seem to be made of atoms as well. And the galaxy itself, um, a typical galaxy contains around, a, you know, a few hundred billion um, stars. And stars, even though there are big differences between stars, at some, from some, you know, first approximation, stars are basically similar to one another, not that different to our sun. Um, and our, gal our galaxy, the Milky Way, contains, you know, several hundred billion stars. So I don't know if you've seen this notation before, but that we will, I'll write that as 10 to the power 11, because, if, you know, 100 billion is a one with 11 zeros. So much of our galaxy seems to be made of atoms. Now, remarkably, 
there are lots of, you know, there are actually lots of galaxies. And like with stars, if you look at, you know, when we look out into the universe and we, you know, we've got very powerful um, telescopes of different kinds, we can, you know, observe galaxies um, you know, from very, very far, very far away. And, you know, in the observable universe, there seem to be you know, several hundred billion galaxies. And to a first approximation, each, you know, the different galaxies are quite similar. So you've got something like several hundred billion galaxies. Each galaxy contains something like several hundred billion stars. So there's something like 10 to the power 22 or 10 to the power 23 stars in the universe. And that stuff is made of atoms. So that means if we can understand the, the structure of atoms and the behavior of atoms and you know, what atoms are made of and, um, and describe more and more precisely, as precisely as we can, what an atom is, we can actually make statements about, you know, we can actually make predictions and statements about the, the universe at large, even though these things are very tiny. Now, there's one important thing that I haven't mentioned here, well, I've, on this slide, but I mean, I, did, I touched on it right at the beginning, is that actually most of the matter in galaxies is not, is not luminous. So uh, most of the matter in the galaxy is actually not in the form of shining stars, which are made of atoms, but it's a more mysterious um, type of material, which we call dark matter. It's called dark matter because it doesn't shine. We can't see it directly um, just um, through its, you know, light doesn't come from it and it doesn't reflect off of it either. But the reason we know it's there is because of its gravitational pull. And roughly there's about five times more dark matter than there is um, atomic matter. And that's a huge um, puzzle. We know it's there, um, but we don't know what it is yet. And so one of the, that's one of the key areas of research in, in particle physics is to try and understand what this dark matter is. And that's one of the things that, you know, that I work, I work on some you know, theories of what dark matter could be and also um, uh, experimental searches for dark matter. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. So this just illustrates the same the, the sort of point in, in a bit more of quantitative detail, the point that by understanding atoms, we can make predictions about the whole universe. Well, as you know, you know the, the simplest atom, which is hydrogen, contains one, one proton and one electron. And then the next simplest one, helium, contains you know, two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. Well, actually, we can measure using spectroscopes um, the how much helium there is compared to hydrogen and how much oxygen there is compared to helium, not just on, the, on Earth, but actually in the universe itself. And this graph shows you the relative amounts of the different elements in, in the universe. It's the relative abundance of elements in the universe at large. And what you can see is, you know, most, the most abundant element is hydrogen, and the next most abundant one is helium, and then after that, it's oxygen, and then carbon. So the heavier the atom, which means the more complicated it is in terms of the number of particles that it contains, the more difficult it is to make. Obviously, in order to make, you know, a helium atom, it requires two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons to come together. That's much more difficult to arrange than just a proton and an electron coming together to, to, to make hydrogen. So, just the, the and you know we can actually do, make these calculations much more precisely, uh, mathematically, um, 
and pred make actual predictions for, for, for how much of each element there should be. And um, that, re you know, that sort of illustrates that by understanding particle physics, you can actually understand a, a, a large scale property of our universe. So let's go back a little further. I'm not going to go, I'm going to do this part very quickly because you, I think you've covered this uh, uh, previously. So um, the structure of atoms, well, our first evidence for that the atoms had structure came from the discovery of electrons. Basically, um, why, you know, electrons? Metals with currents passing through them can emit um, electrons, certain elements, and if then those electrons interact with with another material, you we can infer their presence. So, Thomson did this originally, you know, 118 years ago, um, using a cathode ray tube, which was an old type of. It's just basically a wire with a gas in a in a glass tube, um, and uh, I mean, this is an old technology that you know, the first televisions were made out of these things. Um, and the electrons would pass from the wire, would, would, it would be emitted from the wire and then drift to the end of the glass tube and interact with the glass and, and he observed a sort of uh, glowing, uh, you know, the, the, the glass would start to glow. And that was the first evidence for um, electrons. The first evidence for the nucleus came when um, Rutherford scattered um, alpha particles. Well, alpha particles are actually just helium. We now, we now know them to be helium nuclei, but they were first discovered um, when the first, some of the first radioactive substances were, uh, were discovered. And so he used radioactive sources to generate alpha particles. So alpha particles are charged, they're you know, helium nuclei. And he fired them into a thin, thin sheet of gold, and they were. He, he observed that some of these particles were actually deflected at very large angles. So what you do is you you fire them in, and then you observe their their distribution after they've been after they've interacted with the sheet of gold. So if gold was completely uniform, so in other words, if it was just if it was a completely uniform substance, you would get a very uniform distribution of the alpha particles after they'd passed through it. However, he found that you know some small number of them were, were bouncing off with at very large angles, showing that there was a very hard scattering going on, um, and that was the first evidence that there was a dense uh, nucleus. So then we ended up with this you know sort of famous picture of the nucleus um, which contains protons and neutrons and uh, it's surrounded by electrons. Now to give you an idea of the size of these things, um, that's important, um, atoms themselves have typical sizes which are sort of 10 to the minus 11 to 10 to the minus 10 meters. Now a nu the nucleus is actually much smaller. It's about a hundred thousand times, sorry, it's about ten thousand times smaller, which means you know, ten to the minus four. So, 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 ten to the minus four means one divided by ten thousand. Um, so, actually, this figure that you, this famous figure on the left, is not to scale. You would need to increase the you would need a screen which was 10,000 times bigger, effectively, to draw that properly, which is actually quite a lot, would be quite a large screen. Or you would have to make the nucleus in the, in the middle much, much tinier. Now, um, you know, very interesting things. There are very interesting things about atoms. One is that the charge of the proton and the charge of the electron seem to be exactly equal and opposite. If they were different, atoms would not exist. So that's a, that's a sort of, that's an example of a fundamental question. Why is the charge of a proton 
exactly equal and opposite to that of an electron. And we still actually don't know the answer. We've got some very good sort of theoretical ideas for why that is the case. But experimentally, those ideas haven't been, are quite difficult to test, so they haven't been tested yet. Um, so, but it's a, it's a really fundamental question about our universe, why, the, why these charges are exactly equal and opposite. But, you know, then we can also ask, you know, when we discovered the structure of an atom, we discovered, you know, this layer, these layers of substructure, these, these nuclei and the, the, the electron. Are electrons themselves fundamental particles? Are protons and neutrons fundamental particles? That's another um, key question. Well, we now know that actually protons and neutrons are not fundamental particles, but we don't know if an electron contains structure. So as far as we can tell, it looks fundamental. But if we were able to probe it on a small enough scale, it might turn out to be um, a composite object. <clears throat> so um, I'm now going to give a quick overview of how how we've gone about discovering um, particles in the, in the past. And one of the basic principles behind um, particle accelerators, so in, in, in order to sort of test the laws of physics, of particle physics, and to, you know, for example, to discover the structure inside protons, um, you need to be able to have good control over particles and, you know, make them do things um, in controlled ways, like, like the proton-proton collisions at the Hadron Collider. And the, the principle so that we use for that, uh, we just use electric and magnetic fields to control these particles. So electric current is just moving charge. Now, you may have done this experiment um, in the past. If you take um, an electric, if you take a wire that's carrying some current and you wind it around, you know, say a metal, piece of metal like a screwdriver, you can make a magnet out of it. You know, that's a simple example of an electromagnet. By the same, and by the same token, you can just invert that process. Remember, so a current is just a moving charge and I can make a magnetic field just with a current, but by the same token, if I put a magnetic, if I have a magnetic field, um, it's actually exerting a force on a charged particle. And you can sort of see that in this diagram here. You've got a magnetic field, which is pointing in some direction, and an electron has come in, and it, it will tend to be bent around the magnetic field. And um, so we use strong, so if you have strong electric and magnetic fields, so you can use the magnetic field to bend particles, and you can use the electric field to give, give a charged particle a kick of energy. So you sort of increase the energy using the electric field, and you can control its direction using a magnetic field. And that's how the basic particle accelerators uh, work. Now, the first example, though, of a particle collider was not um, uh, done in a laboratory like at CERN. It's actually um, the first experiments we did. I mean, the actual galaxy itself is a particle collider because, excuse me, I'm just taking a sip of tea. <clears throat> the galaxy itself has, has quite strong magnetic fields um, in it for various reasons, some of which are a bit mysterious still, but we know for a fact that it has magnetic fields. And also, um, you know, there are very high energy processes going on in, in, in the galaxy, you know, just inside stars, for example. Our sun, our sun um, in the center of it, you know, um, quite high energy nuclear collisions are going on all the time, nuclear processes, and the sun and, and other stars are emitting particles all the time and you know there are other processes that can produce um, particles so what happens is every once in a while a charged particle like a proton or an electron 
which originated somewhere else in the galaxy, due to the magnetic field of the galaxy, some of those particles will end up um, uh, coming to Earth. So when it comes in, what it will do is it strikes the upper atmosphere of the Earth, and then it interacts with the molecules of the upper atmosphere. That will create, that could create other particles, as you can see in this sort of diagram here, and uh, you know, sort of have multiple interactions and you create what's called a cosmic ray shower. You've got a shower of particles. And physicists literally used to go up, up mountains and um, we had, in those days, um, sort of photographic emulsion plates that were sensitive to charged particles. And the first, um, you know, dis the discovery of the first particles beyond, you know, um, the, the ones that we knew about in the atom came um, from studying these cosmic rays in mountains. So in this particular example, um, you know, a proton has come in, it's produced these, these, these particles called, um, with the symbol pi, these are called pions, they're a bit like protons, um, they're closely related to protons, but they're unstable, unlike the proton, the proton seems to be very stable. Um, and then these pions are then decaying into a particle here with a symbol mu. Well, that's a muon. So a mu minus is a, so a muon is a particle very much like an electron, but it's, but it's 200 times heavier. As, apart from its mass being you know, 200 times more than the mass of the electron, um, it, its properties are identical to that of an electron. And you know, muons were actually discovered, and pions were discovered um, in cosmic rays. And you know, cosmic ray experiments are, are that's still a, a, an important, active field in particle physics. These days, we have not only cosmic ray detectors um, uh, uh, sort of, uh, that are ground-based. We we have um, cosmic ray detectors in space on satellites, and there's even one on the uh, International Space Station. So, as a result of these cosmic ray experiments, and then later from the sort of, so that, the stuff I was describing there was sort of in the 50s, and from the 50s onwards, which, it was the 50s and 60s, um, a huge zoo of particles were discovered both in these cosmic ray experiments and from the first um, ground-based particle accelerators and particle colliders. And so through that, we actually found out that protons and neutrons are made of more fundamental particles called quarks and gluons. So, um, you know, uh, they're, they're, a proton is made out of what is called um, an up quark and a down quark. So there are two up quarks and one down quark in a proton, and they're sort of glued together by these other particles called gluons. And a neutron is very similar, but it is actually made of, instead of two ups and one down quark, it's made of an up quark and two down quarks. And we've, apart from the proton and neutrons, we've discovered that, you know, particles like pions, and there are actually hundreds of these things which, are, which have a more general name called hadrons. Um, and hundreds of these have been discovered, you know, over the past um, six decades or so. So there are actually, there's a whole zoo of these things. Um, but the most remarkable fact is that all of these particles and all of their properties, which means uh, all of their interactions, the way they behave, um, their charges, uh, etc., etc., are precisely described by an extremely simple model. So, and that is the, the standard model of particle physics that I uh, alluded to at the beginning. So I'll just say briefly um, um, some words about what the standard model 
is. So it contains quarks and leptons and gauge bosons. So the quarks are the six particles in that sort of mauvey purplish color. So they have names like up, charm, top, down, strange, and bottom. I hope you can read that. Then uh, you have leptons, which are these green ones. So the electron is an example of a lepton. So you have electron, muon, and tau. So I mentioned the muon. The tau is an even heavier version of the electron. Um, and then you've got these um, other leptons called neutrinos. So these are a bit like the electron, but they're much lighter and they have no charge. That's why they called. That's why they are called neutrinos. And then you have these things called gauge bosons, which so we have the photon, the gluon, the Z, and the W bosons. These mediate the interactions between the quarks and leptons. So basically, the quarks and leptons are the matter particles, and the interactions between them are described by, uh, are, are sort of mediated by the gauge bosons. So for example, the electromagnetic force, so you know that you've got two charged objects there's an electrostatic force between them. That's simply described by the two objects exchanging a photon. So the force between them is literally, we describe it as, as, a, as a photon, which is a particle of light being exchanged between them. And similarly, the, the strong nuclear force is described. So that's a force that's experienced by the quarks. And that's described by the mediation of, by, by exchange of gluons. And then there's another nuclear force called the weak nuclear force, and that's mediated by the W and Z bosons. And um, the actual, you know, the description of these forces is really very, very simple in some sense. It's mathematical. I mean, the, the actual mathematics is, is beyond uh, sort of A-level um, standard, but you know, if you did physics, um, say for example at, at King's, um, you know, we teach I, te I teach for example the standard model uh, to in the third year uh, at King's, and that's you, you'll yeah be it'll be similar in other universities in the UK. Now the entire periodic table, which means all of atoms, can be explained just by the first column, so the up quark, the down quark, the electron, and the electron neutrino, plus the photon, the gluon, and the W and the Z. So the first column and the last column. Um, we don't know why we've got the second column and third column, for example. So in column number one, the particles are generally much lighter than the particles in column number two and are much lighter than the particles in column number three. So the top quark, for example, that's the heaviest known elementary particle. It has a mass which is, so here the masses are written in these units, uh, in electron volt units. You may not have come across those, but um, uh, 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 one giga electron volt is approximately one proton mass. So the, the top quark actually weighs something like more well, you know, just over 170 proton masses. It's much heavier than an atom, but it's, as far as we know, it's an elementary particle. Whereas an electron is much, much lighter. It's 2,000 times lighter than an atom. So from the electron to the top quark, something is almost, um, it's almost a factor of a million in the mass. So, so the questions that we ask about this is why do we have this structure? Why these masses? Um, and you know, are there more than just these particles? And we, you know, we in fact know that there are more than just these particles. Well, first of all, there's the Higgs boson, and the Higgs boson is actually responsible for giving these part, giving these particles the masses that they have. So all of these particles have a mass, except the photon and the gluon. And uh, the Higgs boson um, is actually responsible for 
providing that mass. So that actually helps us understand what mass actually is. You know, in physics at school, you, we, we learn about mass, you know, we measure mass in different ways. But um, what, what we're getting into here is what mass is. Without a Higgs boson, all of, these, all of these particles would actually have zero mass. Um, so I've sort of said that on this slide here. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the dis this, this Higgs boson was actually discovered at the Hadron Collider um, in, in 2012. Um, I'll probably come back to that in a, um, shortly. Just a few more words about dark matter. I'd mentioned that we know it's there just because of its gravitational force. So how do we actually, let me just say a few more words about that. So the way that we do that is, you know, if we look at, you know, stars, stars shine. So we can actually see all of the stars in the galaxy. And based on that, we can estimate quite well the, the mass of the galaxy, which is in stars. And then if you, if you take that mass um, estimate and, and then sort of uh, look at the way the galaxy is rotating, remember the, the galaxy has a sort of disk-like structure. The galaxies are like sort of thin pancakes um, that are sort of spinning around their centers. They're, a bit, they're elliptical, not exactly round. Um, but, but there's a galactic, you know, the, the galaxies are in a sort of galactic disk shape and the stars sort of spiral around the center of, of, of the galaxy. And if you take um, our description of gravity, which is Einstein's theory of gravity called general relativity, which, we've actually, which has been tested with remarkable precision in various systems, then the galaxies, would, the, the stars in the galaxy would not move with the velocities that, that we're observing them to move with. Moreover, we can look at the gravitational force between different galaxies and different collections of galaxies, um, and they don't move in the right way if all of their mass was just in the, in the mass of the stars that they contain. So this has been an ongoing um, process in in physics over you know the past four or five four or five decades, and now there's sort of almost irrefutable evidence that actually what is required is additional matter in the galaxies, um, which is this uh, dark matter. Otherwise, galaxies would not behave the way that they behave. And it's possible, what, what we're hoping is that we might be able to make dark matter at the Hadron Collider. But uh, we haven't seen any of it yet. So this is a, another slide which illustrates some, you know, our understanding of the history of the universe, but in terms of particle physics. Um, so just to give a simple just, there's a lot going on in this picture, um, so I could actually talk about this picture for hours and hours, but I'm going to just talk about it for a minute or so. You know, this describe this is it's a cartoon of the expanding universe, and from left to right we've got time going, and time here is going from sort of 10 to the minus 44 seconds all the way through to today. So this is a this is a logarithmic time scale. And as the universe expanded, as it expands, it gets colder and colder. So right at the beginning of the universe, it was very, very hot. And it was so hot that the average energy of the stuff inside it, which are, are the particles, the quarks, the leptons, the gluons, and so on, was very high. Um, that means that basically you had a very hot soup filled with these um, elementary particles and they were interacting with each other, being created and destroyed at equal rates. They're in equilibrium. But as it expanded, it got colder and colder. And at various um, epochs, you know, the temperature 
or average energy of the particles in the universe reached critical values that allowed certain things to happen. So when the universe was sort of um, 10 to the minus 5 seconds old, um, the first nuclei started forming. It, the energy of the quarks and gluons became lower than uh, uh, the binding energy of, of quarks, to for, which formed you know, the first protons and so on. So it's more f energetically more favorable to form um, uh, these bound states, which are the first nuclei, the first protons and neutrons in the universe. But the electrons were still roaming around, um, as were photons, but um, at some point the energy, the average energy of the electrons, it was energetically favorable for electrons to bind with nuclei to form um, the first atoms. So that happened when the universe was about 300,000 years old, and at that point the stuff in the universe actually, you know, is mostly atoms. That means that the and atoms are neutral. That means that the photons that were, the, that were there before have nothing else to interact with. So the photons which were around at that epoch are still here today. They haven't been interact. There's nothing for them to interact with. They only interact with charged particles. And there are very few charged particles um, in the universe today. So those photons are still here today, and we've been measuring them um, since the 60s, I guess, and that's called the cosmic microwave background radiation, and that's become a very precise science. And by looking at the, the spectrum and distribution of those photons, we learn about the universe when it was only a few hundred thousand years old, and that's a direct measurement. And from that measurement, you can, we can actually go back further uh, in time and extrapolate back to see if our um, picture, our sort of description, our in terms of the standard model and so on, makes sense, and you know all of this relies on understanding the the, the laws of elementary particles. These different transitions that I talked about, um, uh, are, we understand them exactly in terms of uh, our mathematical description of particle physics, which is the standard model. Okay, um, I'll just say a few words about the, to give you an idea about the Hadron Collider it, um, project itself. So the basic idea is we want, we want to take beams of protons, give them as much energy as possible, then we want to smash them into each other as often as possible, and in the process of those collisions, we will hopefully will create new particles like the Higgs boson or dark matter. But in order to do that, we've got to surround the collision points with particle detectors, um, which which detect what you know, which are designed to sort of detect anything that could sort of come out of a of a proton-proton collision. And you know, the production of new particles is rare; otherwise, we would have seen them before. Um, so that's why we we want to have um, as many collisions as possible, and we want as high energy as possible because the more energy you've got, the more you know. Then you if the energy wasn't high enough, you wouldn't have enough energy to produce a Higgs boson. You know, Higgs boson weighs something like 130 proton masses, and uh, if the if the energy of the initial collision was was less than that, you would never be able to produce it, just based on energy conservation. So the LHC was running very successfully in 2011 and 2012. Then we've had, and that's when we discovered the Higgs boson, uh, and then. The last two years, we were upgrading it so that we could run at an even higher energy. And this year, we started off um, at this much higher uh, energy, which is something that the energy now is uh, something like 13,000. It's equivalent to sort of 13,000 proton masses. To give you an idea of the of the scale of the collider, um, it's a circular 27 kilometer. I mean, the it's a circular collider. It's about 100 meters underground at the Swiss-French border. That's where CERN is located. And it's 27 kilometers in circumference. It's, I mean, it's literally the world's largest 
machine. It's also probably the, you know, the world's most sophisticated uh, machine. And we, we have two proton beams, one going you know, clockwise, one going anti-clockwise, and they actually collide at four different collision points. And around each collision point, we've got a different experimental detector set up. So four actual different experiments. And um, we have actually up to something like a billion collisions per second. So it's quite uh, an operation. And this figure here just gives you an idea of what it's what the LHC looks like in the actual tunnel. So I, I mentioned before we need magnets um, to bend the particles around. So the magnets we use are amongst the most powerful magnets in the world. Um, and the most powerful magnets in the world are superconducting magnets. And superconducting materials only operate at very cold temperatures. So there's something like 1,600 superconducting magnets around the LHC ring. Most of the, you know, each of these magnets weighs something like 20 tons or more. That gives you an idea of, uh, uh, of the scale of it. And um, to, to keep these magnets at superconducting temperatures, we've got um, 100, about 100 tons of liquid helium to keep the thing very cool. And the, these uh, superconductors operate at a operating temperature of about minus 271 degrees centigrade, which is about a degree cooler than empty space. So that's why we say that the LHC is the coolest place in the universe. And just to give you an idea of the magnetic fields, the magnetic fields are sort of um, from a few to 10 Tesla, which is about um, 100,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic, the average Earth's magnetic field. Um, OK, the next slide you can just to get give an idea of the energy in the in the LHC beams, I've sort of converted our particle physics units into um, joules, which will be a unit that you're familiar with. The LHC beam will co you know contains it has an energy of, of order 360 million joules, which is actually quite a lot. It's equivalent to the kinetic energy of a small aircraft carrier moving at 40 kilometers per hour. But it contains vastly fewer particles than, a, than an aircraft carrier. Um, just to give you an idea of the scale of our one of our of our detectors. So this is the Atlas. This is a graphic of the Atlas detector, which is actually the experiment that I work on. Um, it's you know from top to bottom, so it has this sort of cylindrical shape, and what we've, we've, this graphic's got a sort of we've cut out the inside so you can sort of see inside it a bit. Um, it's cylindrical because we want we want it to surround the, the interaction point. So the beams come in from either end into the cylinder, and the collision takes place right in the middle. And then you know stuff comes out, particles come out of the collision, and then we've got different layers of this cylinder, um, which all are which are designed to detect different types of particles that could come out. And it's sort of 25 meters from top to bottom and 44 meters across. This thing, you know, would fill up most of a fo football stadium. Um, it's quite impressive uh, to see it uh, in real life, actually. Um, this slide illustrates, um, you know, this is a, now looking down through the beam axis. This is sort of a wedge of the detector, um, how we detect different particles. Uh, I'm going to skip that. Um, you can find more information, actually, about there's a lot of information on our website, which is uh, if you go to the Atlas, if you just search for Atlas CERN, um, you'll find our media page. Um, we've got lots of uh, sort of educational videos and tools there um, that uh, you can find a lot, lot more information and details about how particle detection is done and so on. Um, just one quick word about how the Higgs gets 
got, got discovered at, at the Hadron Collider. So I've got these diagrams over here um, involving some of the standard model particles that I've mentioned. And these diagrams actually represent the most probable ways for producing a Higgs boson. So the Higgs boson has this symbol H. And you can sort of view these diagrams as um, uh, uh, you know, running from left to right. The initial state is on the left, and on the right is the, the Higgs boson. So, so you can see um, these in the, for example, the red diagram, that's the most, this is the most probable way of producing a Higgs. The initial state here are two gluons. So what's happening here is that each of these gluons is inside a proton. So the first gluon will be in, you know, one in, in one of the proton beams. The second one is in the other proton beam. And then these gluons exchange these top quarks, which sort of fuse together to produce a Higgs boson. This is an example of a Feynman diagram. And actually, we, the mathematical model the standard model um, tells you how to calculate the probability for this to occur when you when two protons collide. And then once it's produced, actually, the Higgs it's a it's a very unstable particle because it interacts it's heavy and it interacts with um, all of the massive standard model particles. And then so once it's produced, actually it decays, and you know it could decay, for example, into into um, electron and anti-electron, a muon and an anti-muon with some probability, um, and we measure, we actually detect the electrons and the muons, and then we work back and try and reconstruct the Higgs boson from its decay products. So that's sort of how it works. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just finish by saying that we're, you know, we're exploring all kinds of ideas um, at the Hadron Collider, like dark matter that I've mentioned. Um, uh, there are many reasons to think that there's physics beyond the standard model, not just observationally, but also sort of theoretically. And uh, we've been searching for some of these, you know, exploring these ideas at the Hadron Collider. Um, so uh, we haven't seen any evidence for them yet, but it's still early days. Uh, um, hopefully, we'll, we'll see some hints of it um, in the current data. So I'll stop there. Sorry, Rob, I ran slightly over. Um, Absolutely fascinating, uh, Bobby, uh, Professor Acharya. Um, and I think really, if, if we're being honest, that, that recaps so much of what we did but, but pushes it far further. Um, fantastic. So um, we have this opportunity now um, both for the students that are in the Hangout who um, I'm sure have, have benefited hugely from seeing all of, all of that, um, but also from anyone who, who's watching on, on YouTube and, and joining us at the moment. Um, people on YouTube, if you uh, want to ask questions at this point, feel free to email in the link on the YouTube page or join the Hangouts Q&A and we'll see questions coming through from there. But I guess at this point, I'm going to pass it over to the students of United Classroom Physics. Um, what ideas, not just on what, obviously, Professor Acharya has talked about there, but also from what you've seen in, in reading and, and looking around the subject, what kinds of questions would you have if you had a particle physicist sitting right there um, with the opportunity to ask a question? And let's go to anyone. Don't 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 feel shy because you're not normally. Um, what would you ask if you had a particle physicist sitting right there, as we have? It's always the bravery of the first, isn't it? Um, uh, Megan. Hi. Um, I have a quick question about the um, Higgs boson and where that fits the standard model. That's an excellent question. Thank you for asking that. Um, so it turns out that the, without the Higgs boson, all of the particles in the standard model would have no mass at all. They'd be completely massless. And that would actually mean that we wouldn't have atoms, um, and the universe would be a completely different place. And we certainly would not be sitting here discussing it. Um, so it's the interactions of the Higgs boson, or more precisely what's called the Higgs field, um, that with, with the particles like electrons and so on, all of the particles that I mentioned that have a mass, 
um, that give them mass. Uh, and so it actually helps us understand a little bit about where mass comes from. Um, and it's amazing that, you know, Peter Higgs, actually he was a, he was a student here at King's College. Um, he wrote down his, I mean, so it's, you know, the Higgs boson is named after Peter Higgs because he wrote down his theoretical ideas in 1964 and it took 48 years before um, we actually verified that those ideas were correct. But it's amazing that, you know, somebody, you know, a theoretical physicist can come up with this, come up with an idea. At that time, we didn't understand why, why the particles we were observing had a mass. And he came up with the idea for solving that problem. And he wrote it down just, you know, with a pencil and paper. And uh, 48 years later, with this huge effort, you know, one of the big, biggest science projects ever undertaken, um, we, you know, it's the biggest science project ever undertaken because it's such an important question. Why particles have mass and where does that come from? Um, and, and actually he was right. Uh -huh. Fantastic. Um, we've had a couple of chat questions. I'm not sure that people online can see those, or the YouTube page can see those, but I'll, I'll ask them uh, for the people who chatted those. Uh, so uh, from Kane, um, would dark matter have antimatter like normal matter? Yes, it would. Absolutely. All particles have antiparticles. Um, that's something also when I was talking about the standard model I didn't mention. But, but for every particle, there's an antiparticle. Now, some particles might have might be their own antiparticles in the sense that the antiparticles are completely identical to the particles. For example, we don't know yet, but a neutrinos, an anti-neutrino might be um, uh, just the same as a neutrino, indistinguishable from a neutrino, but we don't know that. Um, but so what we do know is that there's sort of just just the the sort of mathematical framework that we use to describe um, physics um, tells us just on very general grounds that every particle has to have an anti-particle. Fantastic. Um, so this question is coming from Sophie and uh, she's asking, I think about the Higgs boson, um, so could you say in some ways that the Higgs boson is the only fundamental particle or the most fundamental particle because it's the one that gives mass to the others? No, um, not fundamental, well, not fundamental, well, okay, sorry. So it, it, it is a fundamental particle and in some sense it's more important than, than some of the other particles, you know, um, uh, it's, you know, it's definitely true to say that I would say that the discovery of the Higgs boson, you know, is was as important as the discovery of the nucleus. It's that uh, important. But but when when I talk about fundamental particles, um, I usually mean is a particle made of other smaller particles, like a proton is made of quarks, and um, we don't know if the quarks or the leptons, or the gauge bosons, or the Higgs boson themselves have additional structure. Um, but as far as we, we can tell, um, we they, they don't, but, but it may turn out that they do. Oh, I can't, couldn't so hear that, sorry. The next question is coming from Kane, I think. Mm -hmm. um, does dark matter have a charge? Uh, um, it, if it does have a charge, the charge is very, very, very small. Because if it was charged, light would actually scatter off of it. Photons, light, uh, which is made of, you know, light itself is made of, is made of photons, and light interacts directly with charged particles. That's actually why we can, why I can see you now. And the fact that we have, we can't actually directly see dark matter um, means that it uh, has a small charge. Also, we know quite a lot about the distribution of dark matter in the galaxy. And it's, if it had 
charge, it wouldn't have the distribution that it has. So if it does have a charge, the charge is very, very small. Fantastic. Um, I've got a question, um, which I've never dug into and tried to find out. So I, I'm very interested to hear your response. Um, we talked. You were talking there, and the fascinating slide there towards the end, talking about the energies involved in the actual beam at, at CERN, and talking about the idea that in in those tiny particles, you're cramming in the energy of a, an aircraft carrier moving at about 40 kilometers an hour. Um, the interesting thing I've always thought about. Uh, people have talked about the potential to make mini black holes, and and there's there's lots of kind of scare stories that are spread about those. Yeah. But, but that's still a, a quite a lot of energy in, in a small space. What I was interested in is in the center of um, the actual detectors, is there a wearing effect on, on having these collisions regularly? Um, does, does that actually need to be replaced at times because it's being worn down by the amount of energy being released in there? Yeah, so, um, the, you know, uh, we, we've sort of prepared these detectors for what, what we call radiation damage. You know, radiation is just, are just, it's just elementary particles, right, um, of different kinds. And, you know, lots of particles are going into the detectors. You know, you have, we have a billion collisions per second, and the LHC runs, you know, a significant portion of the, of the year. Um, uh, but the total amount of radiation is very small compared to you know what's released from a nuclear reactor. However, um, uh, we intend uh, you know I think something like a uh, few years from now, maybe four to five years from now, there's a planned sort of long shutdown of the hadron collider, and we're going to upgrade the innermost components, the inner detect inner parts of the detector, which are used for tracking charged particles um, precisely because of this uh, uh, radiation damage. They may degrade, you know, our tests uh, have shown that they may degrade in their uh, ability to perform um, over a few years. So, uh, yeah, it's a good question. Oh, oh, can't oh, no, I'm, I'm muted. I'm, I'm still getting used to all this thing of turning myself on uh, and off in terms of the mic. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, uh, you might have noticed that uh, a couple of our students had to go just yeah, literally sure. because their school was closing. Um, so they were kicking them out for the night, I believe. Um, we've still got uh, four students here um, who uh, I'm sure are fascinated, blown away by what's been, been said here. Um, so, um, I guess, I guess to, to summarize everything that's been said here, and a question which, which often is asked, yes, so uh, the, the other school is about to kick them out as well, so um, fantastic, thank you for letting us know. Um, I guess the deepest question as well is, um, what, what do you hope in the next 10, 20 years for the, for the rest of your career, really, I guess, is the, the logical conclusion of, of what you're working on at the moment? Right, well, so... I, you know, actually come from a you know very theoretical background, and um, there's a sort of extension of, you know, in in the process of sort of trying to solve some of the theoretical problems of the standard model, physicists came up with the idea of what's called supersymmetry, and that led to something called string theory. And um, string, you know, string theory had in, principle has a lot to say about what dark matter is um, and uh, uh, in principle makes uh, testable predictions for what might be observed um, at the Hadron Collider and other experiments. So what I'm actually hoping is that in the next two decades we'll learn a lot more about what dark matter is um, and we will get some evidence for, for this thing called super symmetry, which is a weird symmetry which relates different types of particles to each other. In particular, you know, for every particle in the standard model, like an electron, there would actually be a supersymmetric partner of it, which would have some similar properties. It would have the same charge as an electron, but um, would have uh, a different uh, spinning property. Um, so in particular, the electron is 
I don't know if you've come across the terminology fermions and bosons, but electrons are fermion, whereas the super electron would be a boson. And uh, so I'm hoping that we will find evidence for such particles um, in the coming years. Um, or it might become, you know, something, I mean, a less ambitious thing would be simply just to discover some new particles that we haven't thought of yet. Or nobody, you know, just to discover something new beyond the standard model um, would be, that would be amazing. Fantastic, and and obviously we'll be watching that with uh, very close attention, and hopefully some of the students uh, that we have coming through United Learning and and specifically United Classroom Physics uh, might join in that pursuit too. Now, yeah, as you sure. might have noticed, um, our Donata people have had to go as well now, yeah. um, just because they're closing the school, I think. Um, so I think uh, we've got Chloe here. Fantastic. Um, I think uh, we're probably going to have to draw a day onto that, but. What I'd say to everyone who is watching this or following this later on is if you want to have um, any more contact or ask any more of these questions, feel free to email um, my email address, which you can find on the YouTube page. But I really just want to say a huge thank you to Professor Acharya uh, for participating in this and, and leading us through the weird and wonderful world of particle physics. And um, it's really been hugely insightful and I'm sure a huge benefit to everyone um, watching this later or watching this now. So thank you ever so much, Bobby. And uh, we hope you have every every success in your future endeavors in particle physics. Um, so thanks very much, Rob. Thank you. I enjoyed that. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so I'm going to stop the recording now. Uh, this YouTube clip will finish. Uh,